All right, if you got that sermon outline, pull it out, grab a Bible. Um, we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 this morning. For Christmas this year, our kids gave uh, Michelle and I a subscription to StoryWorth. And if you've never heard about StoryWorth, I mentioned this at the Hunter Supper, but StoryWorth is a, a company that emails a question to you once a week that have been pre-selected by your kids, and you answer the question online, maybe just a sentence, maybe a paragraph, maybe longer. Um, and at the end of the year, they print it all up, and you get this book, you know, for the next generation to have, for the kids to keep, and it's nice. It's nice in one way because it forces you to sort of think back and um, reflect on some of those memories that you might not think about, you might not pass on to the next generation. Um, in another way, it's not so great because it kind of feels like my teacher daughter-in-law is giving me homework assignment every Monday morning. You know, and the email pops up from Krista Farrell. Yeah, here we go again. But uh, it's all good. We love her very much. Um, but I have noticed something that when the question of the week revolves around my growing up years, that one, the one central figure in my memories is always my dad. When I started this little series uh, through Second Timothy, I mentioned that I preached from this book uh, at my father's funeral in May of 1999, and that made it sort of a sacred uh, text for me, beyond the way that it is obviously sacred. Uh, I looked back at some of my notes uh, this week, and as I preached that sermon, prepared for that sermon, it, one of the themes that kept coming back into my mind was that I wished I could have known my dad for more years than I did. Now, obviously, that's not possible, but um, that those thoughts went through my mind. You know, kids come along after a lot of life has already been lived. And by the time uh, we can understand... Uh, the big picture of our parents' lives, usually as kids, we're at a stage where we don't really care that much about it. And when we finally do get around to the place that we do care and we'd like to know, a lot of times we're no longer around to ask. And uh, I had that, those emotions, those thoughts about my dad. I would have liked to have been around when my father was just a kid and see some of those firsthand antics that my grandma always liked to talk about, uh, about him. I would have liked to have watched him play basketball in high school as a six-foot, six-inch center. Um, I would have liked to uh, you know, be around him and known my dad in his Navy years. But most importantly, um, I would have liked to really get a glimpse of how he changed when he put his faith in Jesus Christ. Um, that's really the biggest thing I remember about my father. He came to trust Christ very, just a brief time before I did. I was just a seven-year-old boy when I trusted Jesus, and my dad had only put his faith in Jesus a year before that. And he became a man that took that so seriously that it impacted me, uh, shaped who I am, maybe as much or more than anything else and in any other way. And I think it's kind of fitting to come to this last chapter of 2 Timothy on Father's Day, because Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy, uh, it appears that he had led him to the Lord on the first missionary journey, and the two became inseparable from that point forward. It seems significant that the last letter that Paul chose to write and that we have preserved for us by God in the scriptures is the letter he wrote to Timothy at the very end. And this last chapter is, is rather poignant when you think about it in that context. It's packed full of emotion. Um, but it's also packed full of some powerful lessons that I think are fitting to consider on Father's Day. And so, if you've got a Bible or the Bible app on your phone, find 2 Timothy 4, and we're going to go through the whole chapter quickly today. So much of this letter, just these four chapters, have all revolved around the theme of God's Word. If you think through those four chapters, uh, 2 Timothy 1 we read about that challenge uh, to Timothy to guard the good deposit of sound teaching. It's an emphasis on God's Word. Chapter 2 contains that Awana verse, you know, that I unpacked a little bit in chapter 2 and verse 15. Uh, find God's approval by correctly handling the Word of Truth. And then last Sunday we looked at, we closed with, the most important words in the Bible about the Bible. Uh, in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 and 17 it says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be 
thoroughly equipped for every good work. I guess it's not the microphone. Um, right after that, we're going to get into what we're going to look at today. So, chapter 4, verse 1. In the presence of God and of, all, and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful, careful instruction. Those verses are probably the most commonly used verses at the ordination or installation services of pastors, and I think that's pretty appropriate. Paul's charge there to preach the word is a fitting one for pastors to remember and consider, and a large part of my week for the past 30 years has been preparing sermons. It takes a lot of time to do that. Um, to do what Paul writes here. Be prepared to explain God's word in a way that it corrects and rebukes and encourages with patience and careful instruction. Um, I want to ask how many of those sermons you remember from the past 20 years. Uh, there is never a quiz at the end of the week. Sometimes I struggle from rem for remembering the uh, main points from one week to the next myself. But my hope is that over all these years that uh, these sermons on Sunday have helped you grow spiritually. There's a very old illustration story of a letter that was written to the editor back when there was such a thing that happened every week in the published newspapers. And the letter to the editor in the British Weekly went this way. Dear Sir, it seems ministers feel their sermons are very important and spend a great deal of time preparing them. I've been attending church quite regularly for 30 years and have probably heard 3,000 of them. To my consternation, I discovered I cannot remember a single sermon. I wonder if a minister's time might be more profitably spent on something else. And of course that created a bit of a firestorm in the letters to the editor section uh, for a week or so. And then finally they uh, closed it all off with one last letter that came in to the newspaper and it went this way. Dear Sir, I've been married for 30 years. During that time I have eaten 32,850 meals, mostly my wife's cooking. Suddenly I have discovered that I cannot remember the menu of a single meal. And yet, I have the distinct impression that without them I would have starved to death long ago. And you get his point. You understand what he's saying. That we need God's Word. And we need the preaching of God's Word. And that that contains power. It really does. Paul wanted Timothy to hang on to that fact. And the way that I've looked at the outline here this morning is sort of uh, lessons from this father to his son. And so it transfers to all of us this way. But um, the first lesson was this. The preaching of God's word contains power, especially in a distracted world. And that does describe our world. Listen to how it goes next. Verse 3. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Uh, a little bit like what I said last week, it feels as though Paul's reading our mail in 2023 with those lines. Uh, the time has come when people do not put up with sound doctrine. The time has come when they want to hear what they want to hear. And in society at large, in America at least today, there's been a wholesale turning away from the truth of God's word. It is an age that is disconnected from the truth. And that makes the initial challenge, I think, very, very important. The preaching of God's word is where that truth is found. And so it contains power. And that power is especially important in a distracted world. And so I added the very end, this phrase, always prioritize it. And I would toss that out as a challenge to dads. You know, dads, you set the pace in all of this. Uh, if reading the Bible matters to you, it's going to matter to your kids who watch you. If being in church and paying attention to the Word of God being preached is important to you, it's going to be important to your kids who watch you. Um, and so that's why I say prioritize that. Now from there, Paul moves into some extraordinary phrases. And this is maybe the most memorable part of this chapter. Verse 5, he said, But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am being poured out already like a drink offering. The time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. 
I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Now, you all realize this, but Paul was imprisoned when the time he wrote this letter. He was imprisoned by uh, Nero, the uh, um, Roman emperor who ramped up persecution uh, to incredible degrees for Christians. Paul saw the handwriting on the wall. He would not be released from prison this time. Uh, it would soon die a martyr's death. And so, in verse 6 there, he gives a nod toward that, that awareness. I am already being poured out like a drink offering. The time for my departure is near. But before that, he puts this challenge again to Timothy. Uh, preaching the word starts the challenge, but then he says, keep your head in all situations. That sounds like dad advice, doesn't it? You know, keep your wits about you. Keep your head in everything that you go through. Um, uh, keep your head in all situations. Paul knew Timothy was going to face was going to face some, some challenges, some opposition in his life, uh, and uh, would face hostility for his faith, just like Paul had. He wanted him to walk through that with confidence. And so he says, endure hardship. It's going to come. Endure hardship. Um, do the work of an evangelist and diligently pursue the duties of your role. It is not easy to represent Jesus well in a world that is turning their ears away from the truth, like verses 3 and 4 talk about. Uh, when somebody does that, it does really stand out. A couple of weeks ago, um, the University of Oklahoma softball team won the Women's College World Series. And I don't personally, you know, follow closely women's college softball. Uh, but the story caught my attention because their coach and several of their top players are believers in Jesus and have used the platform that winning the World Series provided for them uh, to talk about Christ. The star player on the team is Grace Lyons. And she published a video that uh, is billed as a thank you to softball. I want to share it with you. Dear softball, I fell in love with you when I was a little girl, always carrying around my glove, throwing tennis balls off the wall, and hitting with my dad in the park. I played with the boys when there was no softball, and then finally switched over once recruiting started. And that's when it started to get serious. I hungered for competition and strived for excellence, but for a while, you were something that my hands had such a tight grip on. My identity was tied so tightly to a game that leads to failure almost all of the time, and I rode the roller coaster of emotions. Then I met Jesus. I learned I have a loving Father who died for my sins and has a plan for my life, a plan to give me a hope and a future. My perspective changed when I realized you were just something I did, not who I was. Jesus tells me who I am and I wanted to bring this light into the softball world and play the game differently. I was so blessed to have the opportunity to attend the best university in the country and play for the best program imaginable. Yes, winning a few national championships and winning some personal honors is amazing and I will never take that for granted. But it is so much greater than what goes on on that dirt. First, I have met some of my best friends and my future husband at OU. Praise the Lord. But even more so, the Lord has given me a platform to shine a light that the world tries to dim. The expectation is to idolize you, and the promise is that true joy comes from reaching a goal that you have put all of your effort into. Yes, we as Christians are expected to work hard at all that we do for Christ, but the real victory has already been won on the cross, Jesus dying for my sin and saving me. Because of this, I have an eternal hope that allows me to play your game free with fullness of joy that comes only from the Lord. With this mindset, I have played the most joyful softball the last five years. What's crazy is that this joy doesn't come after big wins, home runs, championships, etc., because all of those things will fade away. I am filled with a steadfast joy when I see one of my teammates decide to get baptized and become a sister in Christ. I will never forget worshiping with my teammates, singing the song, Nobody, in center field after winning the second national championship. God is so awesome. My prayer when I started college was that I could be a vessel that the Lord uses in his kingdom to bring others to know him. As I leave college softball, I pray that others can know how loved they are by the creator of the world and that Jesus can use you in mighty ways. You just need to be willing and obedient. 
I'll end with one of my favorite verses, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Sincerely, Grace Lyons. When I first came across that, I was a little bit surprised that uh, the NCAA would let that go out branded with their logo and with their approval because that is a powerful, powerful testimony of a young lady more serious about Jesus than she is about softball. And she's pretty good at softball. She's doing the work of an evangelist in the era of ears that turn away from the truth. And yeah, her life is different than yours and different than mine and different than Paul's. But I think that is the point. That we each have a calling, we each have a race to run, we each have a fight to fight. We need to do it in a way that shares our faith with the world in which we live. And holds tightly to that faith. I worded the second challenge, fathers to sons, um, this way. Uh, you have a calling to fulfill, so run your race to the finish, and through it all keep the faith. Paul Wright very, wrote very poignant words, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the faith, I have, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And I hope you see in those words more than just a poetic expression, but a, a passionate pursuit of life's highest calling. We each have a calling, and if you know Jesus as your Savior, you have something that he wants you to do in this world. A mission. There are people that God wants you to reach. There are battles with the enemy he wants you to prevail in. There is a race for you to run. And only you can answer the question how that is going. Um, are you fighting the good fight? Or are you entrenched in skirmishes that don't really matter in the end? Are you racing towards the finish line of standing before Jesus or has a different course tickled your fancy and taken you off target? And are you keeping the faith? The definite article in there is intentional because it communicates more than just having faith, more than just trust. It refers to holding to the corpus, the package of doctrines that comprise the Christian belief. I'm going to see it in a minute here, but Paul had witnessed people, even close friends, just sort of dropping like flies around him uh, to the bright lights of false doctrine. And he didn't want that for Timothy. He wanted him to hold on to the faith all the way. Uh, steady and solid doctrines of Orthodox Christianity and to hold on to those no matter the cost because in the end, it will be worth it. That last verse comes from a man with complete confidence because he says, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord will award to me on that day. And not only me, but all those who are longing for his, longing for his appearing. There's a confidence there. It is going to happen. The end will be worth it. Um, so fulfill your calling. Fully run your race. And through it all, keep the faith. And then there's one last, last uh, challenge from the last set of verses. And I initially worded it this way. People are life's greatest blessings. And at the same time, the source of life's greatest heartaches value them anyway. Verses 9 down to 22 contains a catalog, a long list of names, and we're going to fly over them. And as we do, I want you to think in your mind, is this person described as a blessing or a heartache? Verse 9, do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Demas is number one. Probably fits in the heartache category. Uh, he loved the world, Paul says, and deserted me. Crescens has gone to Dalmatia, or to Galatia, and Titus to Dalmatia. Now, I don't know much about Crescens. We do know a lot about Titus, because Paul wrote a, a letter to him in the New Testament. And Titus, based on that letter, is a bit of a troubleshooter for Paul, and so that one's probably positive. He was on a mission. Likely Crescens were, were too. Uh, these two guys were off doing what Paul wanted them to do. Blessings. Only Luke is with me. Dr. Luke, the one who wrote the letter we spent a year and a half studying, stuck it out with Paul through thick and thin. And here he is. Paul's in prison. Luke's there too. That's a blessing. Get Mark, verse 11. Get Mark, bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I'm really glad that note got inserted in the letter. 
Uh, because the last time you see Mark is in Acts chapter 15. The first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas, they head out and they take John Mark with them. But at the very first stop in Asia Minor, Mark bailed. He left. He went back home. And we don't know why, but it was a dividing point. And when the second missionary journey started, I was ramping up. Barnabas wanted to give Mark another chance. Paul said, no way. He walked out on us. And the two, these two mature Christian believers, missionaries, went different directions because of that. But now you, here you are, years later, and Paul recognizes that there's value in having Mark near. Pick him up on your way to come see me. He's helpful in my ministry. There's an example, I think, of a heartache turned into a blessing. Where did we stop? Verse uh, 12, I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, my scrolls, especially the par parchments. Tychicus is on a mission for Paul. Uh, Timothy is going to come and bring the things that Paul needs. Both of those guys are blessings. Verse 14, Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he's done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. That one's pretty clearly negative. Um, this may have been the same Alexander, the, the uh, coppersmith from Acts 19 that riled up the whole crowd against Paul in Ephesus and really drove him from town. And if so, Paul's writing this at the end of his life. That guy's still there and Paul knew Timothy was there too and he feared for what Alexander might do to his young friend. Jump down to verse 19. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. All blessings. Priscilla and Aquila were colleagues. They were mature, seasoned saints. And Onesiphorus, we met back in the first chapter as that one guy that I said, be an Onesiphorus. That one guy who tracked Paul down, did whatever he needed him to do when nobody else was there to help. Clearly positive. Um, Erastus stayed in Corinth. I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eublius greets you, so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. Uh, short list there, but all people that were teammates, that were guys willing to put a lot on the line, some that were sidelined through illness. But then Paul sends greetings from the church there. They're in Rome. You put all that together, it's kind of a mixed bag, isn't it? And you got to wonder, why did God preserve this part of it? Why would God include all these different people and these personal comments about them? Some good, some not so good. Uh, mentioning individual people. And I think the answer is right there. Uh, people are life's greatest blessings and the source of life's greatest heartaches. And Paul's point in sharing those names, uh, clearly identifiable people, was that he wanted Timothy, hey, value individual people. Whether they bring good or whether they bring bad. But it's the middle section of that entire thing that I kind of skipped over that I want to focus on. If you go back to verse 16. Paul said, at my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. That first offense was likely uh, a first hearing before Nero or one of his underlings, and nobody was there. Paul stood alone. Uh, no counsel to represent him. No one came to his defense. No one even there for moral support. And no one had his back. In his most desperate place, Paul stood by himself, powerless and alone. But I love where he goes next because he says, and yet, the Lord stood at my side. You couldn't see anybody in the courtroom. It would appear to the human eye that he stood there unsupported, but Jesus was in the room. Jesus was in the room. He had never left him. He gave him strength so that through his defense, Paul could, as he says there, fully proclaim to the Gentiles the message of the gospel. Um, 
He was even delivered from the lion's mouth. And there's no way to really know what Paul meant by that. Uh, it, could be, uh, it could be a figurative expression, or it could quite literally be that since the Romans under Nero would toss Christians into the arena, that somehow Jesus had stood by him and protected him through that. We don't know. But we do know that he was completely confident that Jesus was there. Jesus had never left him. And he would, that would never change. And one day soon he would arrive at that heavenly kingdom. So my last challenge, it kind of expands with this last piece. That uh, people are life's greatest blessings and the source of life's greatest heartaches. Value them anyway, but remember the last part. The one constant, the one constant through it all is the presence of Jesus. I went to a little Christian school uh, my last three years of, of high school. There were 100 kids, K through 12, so it was a little school. Um, the school mascot was the Conquerors. And that's, I know, corny, but it was based on Romans 8. Uh, Grace Lyons shared her favorite verse from Romans 8 earlier. Um, but uh, our theme, our mascot, came from later in the chapter. Romans 8, 35 to 39, it says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love those verses. I obviously didn't fully understand them when I was a kid in a Christian school, high school. But the more that I have read them and studied them over the years, I realize they highlight a powerful truth that echoes what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 4. They highlight that it doesn't matter what you have happening in your life. It can be a wonderful thing. It can be a terrifying thing. But if you put your faith in Jesus, you're not going through that alone. This little paragraph... And the center of it all is that one little phrase, um, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And you can back out in both directions and find a list of things, list of things that can happen. Hardship, persecution, sword, death, present, future, angels, demons. None of those things change the center. None of those change that we are more than conquerors because of Jesus. And in fact, they back up a little further even, and you realize that that's how he starts, that's how he ends. Nothing can separate us. Nothing can separate us from that love of God in Christ Jesus. If you have put your faith in Jesus, you are not going through whatever you are going through by yourself. Jesus stands by your side. He is the constant. He is the one that never leaves. He is the one that will always be there and will always give you grace. I read a quote. I'm going to wrap it up here. But I read a quote by Philip Yancey this week. He said, Human beings do not readily admit desperation. When they do, though, the kingdom of heaven draws near. That first part is probably accurate about most of us. The second part is clearly a fact. Uh, when you turn to God in your darkest moment, when you have that feeling that you are all alone, if you have trusted in Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is near. He is standing by your side. He will help in the hardest of things. And Paul wanted Timothy to get that, to remember that, to live his life based around that. And in fact, the final words of his letter are the final words that we have from the Apostle Paul. Uh, they bring that theme back around because he says at the very end, the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. First part is singular. Paul wanted Timothy to remember the Lord is with you in this. 
second half is plural because Paul knew people like us all these years later would be uh, reading this and the message lingers still. God gives grace. He's present. He will help you through whatever you face if you ask for that help. And so those are the three challenges from fathers to sons. Prioritize God's word. Run your race to the finish, but as you do, make sure you hold on to the truth, the faith, what we believe as it's portrayed in Scripture. And then thirdly, value people. People matter. God calls us to love people like we love ourselves. But remember this, the one person, the one individual that will never leave, will never forsake, and that you can always count on is Jesus. For the fathers in the room, it's a little challenge. You carry influence that you do not fully understand to shape the spiritual direction of your children. You really do. And so model it well. Model what he talked about here well. Model well what you know will please God, not just when he sees it in you, but when he sees it in them. Hey, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for this challenge and how it has uh, affected my own heart this week in working through that and thinking about the truth that is portrayed there. Uh, I would pray that we would all take that with us. We recognize in this world that is uh, very much turned away uh, from the truth, that, that we would realize, well, we have truth. We have God's truth. We have the Word of God. We need to keep our feet firmly planted on it. And that, you know, when, when life happens and things become challenging, that we focus forward, we run the race, but we hang on to the faith. Uh, what's taught in your word and one of the greatest truths taught there is that when everyone else is turned away when you feel all alone if you know Jesus you're not I am so thankful for that in his name I pray